All right, hello sixth graders. I hope you're doing well. Um, so we're doing a video. Uh, Mr. Geatman asked me to do one on all the vestments that we wear. So we're just gonna kind of pretend like you're all here and then we're gonna go through all the vestments uh, that I wear. Actually, I'm gonna start with um, what priests normally wear almost every day. And so you notice that we wear black. So why does a priest wear black? And then why does he wear this white collar around his neck? Um, well, there's different styles, first of all, and uh, I have two different styles that I wear. You notice one of them sometimes is just the white in front. Other times I wear one that has white that goes all the way around, and then it's in front and all the way around. There's just different styles. And the reason why we wear things called uh, collars um, is just to symbolize that we're set aside for the service of God. Um, the other reason is uh, that we're supposed to be speaking in a, in a world that's supposed to be... Uh, dark and often devoid of truth, um, that this white collar represents our voice that is supposed to speak uh, the truth to the darkness just as Jesus was the light in the darkness. And so that's why we wear the collar. Um, I got different stories about that and other reasons. Um, somebody, a kindergartner once in a school that wasn't here called me and uh, asked what that white thing was around my neck. And um, I said, it's a collar. And he said, a collar? Are you a dog? And uh, the teacher was just was mortified and she said, oh, I'm sorry, Father, he said that. I'm like, ah, it's okay. So I just talked about how, in a sense, yeah, Mother Teresa used to call herself, uh, used to think of herself as a little puppy dog that would follow the Lord around. And so I thought, well, that's a perfect analogy too. As a, as a priest, I'm supposed to be in service uh, to Jesus. And so just following around like an obedient uh, puppy is supposed to be um, the way of life for the priest or religious. So, and all of us to more or less an extent. Um, but the collar symbolizes somebody that's set apart specifically for the service of God. And so that's why we wear the black. Um, I've heard different explanations of why the per, uh, priest wears black. You might notice that priests wear different colors too. Um, uh, I heard once an explanation that priest wears black because he's in mourning for all of the people that don't know the light yet. So that's sort of the darkness and the light um, explanation. So that's, that's that. Um, that's kind of why a priest wears black. And it's great if you're drinking coffee and you spill some on yourself because then... Nobody can see the coffee, so you can spill as much as you want all day, and it's perfect. So, one of the other things that you notice that I wear often around here, especially on Wednesdays when we're doing adoration, is this long, uh, what some people call a dress. It's actually called a cassock. And so, why do people wear a cassock? Well, a cassock is a traditional uh, garb for religious people, uh, for a diocesan priest, which I am. Um, it was often something that you wore around your parish as you were going in the church. But now diocesan priests have to travel all over in cars. And so they tend to wear this rather than this. Um, because if you're driving around and hitting brake pedals and gas pedals in this, you can often uh, have an issue if you get caught up or something like that. You could cause an accident. So don't always wear this. You can. But the reason why we wear this particular style, um, this is very popular in a lot of like Mediterranean uh, places. Um, because it's supposed to be a little cooler. Sometimes these are white and most the Pope wears a white one of these. But the other reason is is because this is um, a garment that you wear that is the, the most modest garment you can possibly wear. Right? There's no... This doesn't define your shape, uh, the, your, your body as a shape or anything like that. It doesn't define your legs or anything. It just pretty much defines your arm and the only things you can really see of your skin are your face and your hands. And so that's why uh, this garment is uh, worn often, because it's a, a cassock, first of all, but also because it's the most modest thing that you can buy or that you can, uh, that you can wear. All right, so as far as, well, I can do this one too, because this oftentimes goes over, this is called a surplus. I'm not sure what they call it a surplus, but it would be put over the top of the cassock like this. And the reason why is often these were worn uh, before a person was a priest, because it was just kind of half of the symbol. And it was a representation, anytime you wear a white garment, especially as a Christian, a baptized Christian, what it means is that you're baptized and that you're purified before God. And so that's, that was part of the garment that a person who was about to be a priest would uh, wear this in order um, to symbolize their steps to the priesthood, which is why you'll see servers wear these as they're going. And that's one of the reasons why the girls wouldn't wear the cassock and the surplus. Um, because they wouldn't be on the way to holy orders or to the priesthood. All right. Now, when Mass comes, um, 
The first thing that the priest does is he says a prayer and he washes his hands. Obviously, you're probably used to washing your hands nowadays, but a priest is always asked to wash his hands. And symbolically, he's supposed to be washing himself um, of cleansing himself of his sins, which is one of the prayers that we say at Mass when the priest washes his hands. He first puts this garment on. This is called an amos. I'm not really sure why they call it an amos, but uh, amici is, is meant to be a friend in Italian. So I don't know if an amos and amici, if that means the same thing. It's not really a friend exactly. Um, if you don't have any friends, I guess it'll do. Um, but this is supposed to be worn or was originally worn as a helmet. Because remember, in the old churches, <clears throat> before they had heat inside and, and heating and air conditioning and ventilation and all that other stuff, it would get very cold to say Mass, and so you'd often wear this as a helmet, and as you were saying Mass, just to stay warm. Well, eventually, um, as time progressed, it became uh, a symbol of the helmet of salvation. So as we approach God, that becomes the helmet of salvation, and we say a prayer, uh, Lord, uh, put on me the helmet of salvation. Well, let me read the prayer here. Yeah, here it is. The, look, the prayer is, Place, O Lord, on my head the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. So that's the helmet of salvation, like you'd wear a helmet in battle. As you go into liturgies, you're going to battle evil. You put that helmet on, but then it gets dropped below the shoulders, and then it gets tied around the waist like this. And then you tuck it in, like so. So this is just a meant, meant to cover up all the priestly vestments. When you go to Mass, you're required, you're supposed to as a priest, to cover up all street clothes, which includes what I'm wearing now. So you're supposed to cover everything up. Again, that's symbolic of the baptism, because your, your darkness, your sin, has been washed away in baptism. And so, practically, this thing serves as a way to protect the elb. It's much easier to wash this. Um, than it is to wash this whole thing. Uh, so there's a practical purpose in it too. Once the amos <coughs> is on, okay, we got that, the amos. Should we do, <coughs> I know I can't hear you right now, but what if I say, all right, everybody, what is this? The amos. Amos, yay, Mr. Geatman got it right. <coughs> the next thing I put on is the alb. And alb, um, alb means to clean. So remember, just as in the baptism, garment that we wear, this alb is symbolic of the baptism, and it's the first thing that we put on because it's the first sacrament that we receive. So again, symbolic of the baptism that we received, same thing with the priest. Uh, the next thing he puts on is called the cincture, okay? So those of you who might have, uh, I'm sure some of you are studying Spanish or know Spanish, um, the cincture in Spanish, the word for belt is cinturón. So the cinturón and cincture, they come from the same root words. So the cincture is put around the waist. And most of you, I think, know how to tie this special knot. And the cincture is put around the waist. <clears throat> and the prayer that said that, let me say this in English. Gird me, O Lord, with the cincture of purity and quench in my heart the fire of concupiscence that the virtue of continence and chastity may remain in me. And so this one goes around the waist, like a belt. Okay, and then we'll leave that loose. The next one is the stole. Here's the prayer for the stole. Restore to me, O Lord, the state of immortality which was lost by my first parents. Of course, you know that's Adam and Eve. And although I am unworthy to approach your sacred mysteries, that's, that's the, the Mass, grant me nevertheless eternal joy. So the stole is placed over the shoulders and down in front. You'll notice that the deacons, when they wear a stole, Deacon Dave, he'll wear one that goes across his shoulder like a sash. So it's a little different. You'll notice the distinction between those two. And the reason why we wear a stole is because it's the symbol of authority. So most of the vestments that we have are, their tradition comes from ancient Rome. And in Rome, if you were a senator and you had authority in the Roman Forum, you were permitted to wear this stole which represented your authority. So there's a lot of uh, priests and pastors and religious uh, people, I suppose, that will still wear stoles. Um, you might see at a graduation, a college graduation or at a high school graduation, 
you'll see someone don a stole um, as they're giving their commencement address because it's an official sign of authority because in this case of their education, but in our case, it's the authority that's given to a priest by God to say the words of institution um, and change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And also a priest is always supposed to wear a stole when he does confession or any sacrament really because it represents his authority to do that. Okay, so any questions on that? Anyone? No? Okay. You can type some questions to Mr. Geatman or email me and I'll get back to you. All right, then the cincture rope gets tied around here. Uh, people don't always do this, but I like to keep it because it keeps these things from flapping around or if I genuflect, it keeps them close rather than having them spill out. So that is the symbol of authority. This is called, wait, do you remember what this is called? A uh, stole. Stole, exactly. Okay, and what's this one here? The amethyst. And the white one? The alb. Okay, good. Uh, this is called a chasuble, and a chasuble's origins are actually a Roman, a Roman poncho, okay? So they'd say, well, that's just a Roman poncho, that doesn't mean anything. Well, actually it does. It came to symbolize uh, the charity. It's, it, it's an overflowing charity, and it covers authority, so that charity is more important than authority. So this chasuble goes over the head like this, just like a poncho, and it just drapes around the arms. Now, this is called a chasuble, right? You'll notice how these are not connected, okay? I hope you can see that with the camera. This, for a deacon, is called a dalmatic. All right, everybody say dalmatic. Dalmatic. Dalmatic, all right? Notice how in this one, if you look on the sleeves, that they are connected. So most people can't tell the difference between a dalmatic and a chasuble. Um, because they lo both look the same from the front, with the exception of the different bars or designs. Sometimes dalmatics look exactly like chasubles, um, but the distinction you can always tell is this one has sleeves that are bound. And that's symbolic of the deacon. Uh, he's bound to charity by the bishop. Okay, so he's actually closer to the bishop in some sense than the priest is, because he's supposed to be the bishop's right-hand man who serves in parishes. Um, so... Uh, let's see. That's the difference between a dalmatic and a chasuble. So if you're ever wondering what the difference is, if you're seeing a priest, wondering if you're seeing a priest or a deacon, just pull his sleeves and see if they come apart. If they don't, then he's wearing a dalmatic and he's a deacon. All right. Um, the next one is the uh, the microphone I put on. Uh, there's not an official prayer for a microphone because microphones are only about 50 years old, maybe at the most, when people started using them. Um, maybe a little older. They had microphones before that, but if you notice in old churches um, where the altar was, there was a big round area in the back. And again, when a priest used to say mass um, with the people as the head of the worship, he was able to speak words to that rounded wall. And then that rounded wall would actually reflect noise back. And that was their natural um, microphone. If you see or look up anything on Roman amphitheaters, you'll notice that they were designed specifically so that large crowds of people could hear things. And the church, Catholic Church through history, took that design to amplify the sound of the priest so the priest or the people could hear um, the prayers of the priest as he was saying them on their behalf. So, and I guess that's about it. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, oh, we want to do colors? Yeah. Okay, so there's four colors. All oh, five, I guess. So there you have a white one. That's de generally done in festive seasons. We'll use it for Easter, for high solemnities. We have two different versions of white. Um, one that has blue banding on it. The blue banding is for uh, Mary usually. So all the Marian feast days. How many feast days of Mary are there? Like 18? That are solemnities? Not solemnities, oh. just regular Oh Mary. gosh, there's like 20, yeah. Yeah, there's like 20 and then every Saturday is supposed to be celebrated as a day for Mary. Uh, green re represents ordinary time, so if there's, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean like ordinary, like regular. What ordinary time means is ordinal time, and ordinal numbers are, are is the name for numbers that say first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, those are called ordinal numbers, which is why we call it ordinary time. It just means counted time. It doesn't mean that it's ordinary or plain or we can't get anything out of it. 
So green is a time really to grow, symbolic of growing and of hope in our faith, growing in our faith and growing um, in our knowledge of, of Christ. So it's just kind of a time to lay back. There's nothing um, necessarily high about it or celebratory, but it's a time to just sit back, relax, and learn more about your faith. But you still have to go to Mass, though. You're still supposed to. All right. So violet, again, is another color that we use in Lent and Advent. Those are both penitential seasons. And there's a couple of reasons why we wear uh, violet. And the reason, I'll give, just give two. The first reason we wear violet is because it's a symbol of penance, okay? It's a symbol of penance that we're supposed to be uh, doing penance. What does penance do? Penance is a way to say no to things that we really want and in order to say or open our heart up more to God, okay? so. Obviously, you guys are at home, your life has changed, um, you're learning at home, all of these things are very different, and you're probably finding them very penitential, because the reality is there are many things that you used to be able to do that you still want to do, but you can't, okay? So always remember that uh, freedom is always found in doing what God wants us to do, and not in doing what we want to do. That, that's perfect slavery, doing what we want to do. Perfect freedom is doing what God wants to do, and when we unite what we want to go do with what God wants to do, we have perfect freedom. Um, so again, the penance that we're supposed to be practicing is always a way of opening an avenue up to us to be able to do God's will more. Okay, so you're going to notice that tension or frustration that's happened in your life in the last few weeks. Um, that, although it's difficult and it's not easy, the reality is it's supposed to form us to, to recognize what true freedom is, is not the ability to do whatever we want, but the ability to do what God wants us to do. And that's the whole purpose of penance, that we can say no to our own will in those little ways. And you guys are doing it in big ways now. But so that we can say yes to God. All right, so the other, uh, even better, uh, representation of violet is that it's a symbol of royalty. Okay, in the ancient world, if you had access to purple clothing, you usually had to be a king or a prince or somebody that was very wealthy because the dyes they used to make violet cloth were very, very expensive. And so in order to get it, you had to pay a lot of money. So violet represented a form of, of royalty because you were um, donning something that was very expensive. And so again, one of the symbols of the violet color is the symbol of royalty. Um, you'll notice that Jesus, as we hear about his passion this week during Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday, you're going to hear that he was dressed in a purple cloak. Now, they did it to make fun of him, um, but the reality was it was, in fact, the color of royalty. That's why they did that. They were mocking him for claiming to be king, um, but obviously he really was. So anyways, that's why we wear this in the penitential seasons. It represents both of those things. Okay, makes sense? Uh, the last color that we have is red, and red symbolizes usually, I think of it two ways, of fire and of blood. Fire of the Holy Spirit, and then blood of martyrs, so those who have died for the faith and actually shedding their blood. And uh, that's why we were red, and red is my favorite color. You'll notice that there are colors of cinctures that are all corresponding with the color of the vestments. Um, the last color we wear is rose. I'm not really sure why we wear rose, but we do. It's the it's, joyful color. It's the joyful color. It's supposed to be the joyful color um, during the penitential seasons. So it gives us hope as we make our way through those penitential seasons that the end is almost upon us. So, all right. Again, if you have any other questions, uh, it's good to see you guys, even though I can't really see you. But, uh, yes, Mr. Geatman? Oh, I was going to ask, can you also have a black chasuble? Actually, yeah, that's right. I forgot. You can wear black. So during funerals and during uh, November 1st, which is the Feast of All Souls, you're able to wear black. And in fact... Oh, you have a black one. Just this year, somebody bought me a black vestment. So you can see that that would be where, obviously, again, it's a symbol of darkness, um, especially when it comes to death. And again, <clears throat> not darkness for its own sake, but the fact that um, there's a lot of mystery surrounding what God has revealed to us as far as death goes. And so black was an always an appropriate color just to symbolize um, the, the, I don't know what you'd call it, the fact that this life has an end. And uh, we have to recognize that this life has an end or else our faith doesn't really mean anything. 
So that symbol, symbolic color of black, of course, is the, the symbol of mourning and sadness. And you say, well, why don't we won't be sad because we're Christians? Well, remember Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, um, <clears throat> for, theirs is the, they, for, for they will be consoled. And so it's okay to be sad um, uh, because the sadness means that you've loved something. And when you lose something that you've loved, um, there should be appropriately mourning. Otherwise, you might question, well, why did you really, did you really love it in the first place? If you weren't sad about something you lost, there's probably a question of whether or not you actually loved it or not. So there's nothing wrong with uh, mourning or being sad, especially at times of being separated from things that we love. Um, but there's always supposed to be hope in there because God gives us the consolation of knowing that we will receive everything back um, that we've lost and loved, loved and lost. So that's the, uh, the black one. I forgot that we had this. So and that one I have not worn yet, so we'll see this year maybe. All right, any questions, you can email me, or I don't know what, you guys are using several different types of communication methods, and um, I'm hoping they begin to settle down, or they begin to settle on one, maybe, or even two. But uh, remember, you can catch masses in the morning if you want to keep up sort of a rhythm of school. But uh, I'll see you guys later. Hope we can do these videos again. Bye.